We saw a president speak today who is clearly serious about climate change. That is not the president who came into office eight years ago, but it's clear that the president who's leaving office knows climate change is his legacy issue. That did not happen by accident. There has been historic momentum in the climate movement in the United States and globally, but we've been waiting a while to see the kind of political power in the United States climate movement, and I think we have it. So that's a very exciting development, and I think it's largely why we saw the kind of speech we saw today. Just to highlight a couple of reasons why that momentum is real. First, we saw 400,000 people on the streets of New York last September for the People's Climate March, the largest climate march in history in one place, also the most diverse. We see thousands of cities adopting clean energy plans all over the country. And lastly, and I'm particularly excited about this, we saw a movement victory in the president's rejection of the Keystone XL pipeline. This pipeline is much more than a symbolic victory. It would have been the equivalent of building 51 new coal plants, something we know we cannot afford. And everyone thought we would lose this battle. Every person in Washington, all the, all the experts, thought the movement was foolish for taking this fight on. And in fact, we won, to everyone's surprise, even our own. And just to point out that this is a critical test for all world leaders. We cannot afford to build projects that increase our reliance on fossil fuels. That day has ended. President Obama validated that test for heads of state. And now we need to see that from many more. That was one test that he passed, but the exam has many more questions. And we will see over the course of these two weeks how well the US is able to respond. Alden will speak to that further. Last thing I want to say, you can be assured that this movement in the United States is not stopping. We are building, we're getting stronger by the day. And so the commitments that are made will be followed up on. There will be a level of pushing for accountability that I think we have not seen in the past, and that's critical. You'll see it in people fighting for a strong clean power plan. You'll see it in people calling on institutions to divest from fossil fuels. We'll be announcing new commitments on December 2nd here at the COP. Finally, you'll see it in people continuing to champion clean energy. After all, three quarters of Americans favor a strong agreement in Paris. This might come as a surprise given our presidential candidates. In any case, it's clear what we need to see from leaders here. We need to see a commitment to transitioning to the next economy. We know we need to leave fossil fuels in the ground and create a just transition to 100% renewable energy. We're looking for that kind of leadership, and we saw some glimmers of it today. Thank you. I last participated in a climate summit in Montreal 10 years ago, when it was embarrassing to represent the United States. As a colleague then from a sub-Saharan African nation asked me, Jay, if the renewable energy you tout makes so much sense, why is the richest nation in the world, the biggest economy in the world, not embracing renewable energy at scale so as to drive down the cost and make it possible for communities now without electricity to leapfrog over the fossil fuel period that was so damaging to the rest of the earth and instead power up for the first time with renewable energy. 10 years on, the United States now brings street cred to these negotiations. With the Obama presidency and its first time term having doubled fuel economy standards that were stagnant for 25 years, thus cutting carbon in half in, those seg in that sector, and with the first ever limits on carbon pollution from our biggest source of global warming, coal burning power plants. Those limits, known as the Clean Power Plan, are now the law in the United States. My home state in Minnesota is just one of the many states that are finding that meeting and exceeding those limits will be easy because of bipartisan policies we passed eight years ago and have demonstrated already in a small state like Minnesota that we've grown 15,000 clean energy jobs while exceeding the clean power plant trajectory and that we expect to grow a total of 35,000 jobs in the next 15 years. The economics demonstrates the need to keep ratcheting up our ambition. Minnesota, I'm here because we're the home to an inordinate number of Fortune 500 companies that have stated their support for the Clean Power Plan and for success in these negotiations, and many of them are here this week. 
Several of those companies include Best Buy, Target Corporation, Cargill, and General Mills. Our biggest utility company, Excel Energy, which is the fourth largest in the United States, in January of this year, just 10 years ago, said it would be impossible to close its biggest coal plants and replace them with clean energy. It would be impossible to do that. And seven months later, based on our analysis, they are now going beyond the clean power plan to a 60% reduction and closing two of the largest coal plants in eight states in the United States because the clean energy is undercutting the cost of natural gas. Clean energy from wind and clean energy from peak solar in a state, a northern state like Minnesota. So we think that means that every nation at the summit needs to think about how to plan for rationally ratcheting up those investments as economic opportunities arise. President Obama ended today by urging the states to work on an agreement that will make all the world's children proud. I and Fresh Energy for several years now have recognized a more ambitious need of responsibility. We will all feel to not future generations, but to kids growing up today, kids who make this such a beautiful planet. We need to be able to tell kids growing up today that in 2015, working collaboratively at the Paris Climate Summit, we did everything we could on climate, and it worked. Thank you. We also appreciate the existing and proposed actions of increasing energy efficiency, keeping fossil fuels in the ground, transitioning to clean energy, poverty eradication, and preserving the planet for future generations. However, in this case, the devil is most definitely in the details. As we move through the negotiations this week and return home for implementation of our commitments, we need to focus on definitions, we need to focus on processes, urgency, ambition, and stringency. Here at the COP, we have NAACP de delegates who face impacts from the drivers and the results of climate change. We, we have represent a representative right here in the room from Indiana, where they're host to over a dozen toxic coal-fired power plants. We have, we, we'll, we'll have representatives from California, who, which is experiencing record drought, um, record wildfires, and is threatened by sea level rise. We have a representative from Mississippi, who, who is a a survivor of Hurricane Katrina who had to flee with her very life with her family um, when, the, when the storm was approaching. We also have a representative from New York where they're still in post super storm Sandy recovery mode and they're threatened with war disasters with the, with the uh, specter of sea level rise. We also have a representative from Houston, Texas where they are at the intersection of being polluted by an unregulated petrochemical corridor and where this year they have experienced record flooding. And I myself am from Chicago originally, where a record heat killed hundreds some years ago, and where we hosted four of the most lethal coal plants in, in our city limits that were, attributed, um, that were attributed to 40 asthma deaths and 1,000 hospitalizations per year. We are linking arms with our comrades, um, both nationally and internationally, including the Indigenous Environmental Network, Gulf South Rising, the It Takes Roots delegation, which represents frontline communities in the United States, and with our Global South comrades, including the Pan-African Climate Justice Alliance, the Third World Network, and others. We stand here for people who can't be here, including the 1,800 people who died in Hurricane, Hurricane Katrina and their families, the four people who died just this year in the um, flooding in South Carolina, and the 76,000 coal miners who have died of black lung disease since 1968, and all the other people who are impacted by the drivers and the impacts of climate change. We're here for the communities who stayed home to continue to work on solutions locally while we carry their stories forth with reverence. As President Obama stated, sorry, As President Obama stated, the climate is changing faster than our, our efforts to address it. As such, we need to work harder and we need to work smarter. On behalf of the communities living next to nuclear reactors spewing radiation, the biomass facilities spewing carcinogens and other toxins, and the residents who are being shaken by earthquakes or whose water supplies are being contaminated due to fracking for natural gas, we need stringent definitions of clean energy to focus on solar, wind, geothermal, and ocean energy. On behalf of communities in the shadow of coal plants and oil refineries and other polluting industries, we need to ensure that trading that will make pollution hotspots even hotter is eliminated from our carbon reduction plan. On behalf of the frontline communities ravaged by storms, threatened by displacement from sea level rise, and facing hunger due to shifts in agricultural yields, 
We need aggressive ambition in both emissions reduction and in committing to the Green Climate Fund and other domestic me mechanisms to ensure that the country and communities have the resources they need to invest in climate smart development and disaster risk reduction. President Obama stated that the biggest enemy here is cynicism, but I would also add corporate greed to that list, as it is reckless, reckless development without regard for people on the planet that got us to where we are today, with record loss of life and degradation of our ecosystem. What will it take to turn this around is new leadership of frontline communities and global South nations whose voices are too often suppressed and whose power is often stripped by the very corporations that are polluting the planet. As frontline groups, we are already leading on building resilience and establishing energy efficiency and clean energy projects, local food projects, recycling and stormwater management and more. We as frontline community groups will be pushing to ensure that our governments commit to moving forward aggressively on policies and practices that facilitate the transition to 100% clean energy with economic justice measures to ensure that this is a community-driven transition with shared wealth building and a much more aggressive timetable for emissions reduction and at least a $5 billion contribution to the Green Climate Fund of the United States. So thank you so much. Thank you, Jackie. Um, next up is Alvin Meyer from the Union of Concerned Scientists to speak to us a little bit about how the speech influences this process here, and then we're going to open it up for questions from all of you. Alvin? Thanks, Kaya. And uh, as some of you know, I've been to 20 of the 21 COPs, and I don't think I've seen uh, the momentum for action that we see coming into Paris. It's, it's really uh, very different, certainly, than six years ago in the run up to Copenhagen. There's much greater awareness of the impacts and costs of climate change, uh, as others have mentioned, efficiency in renewable energy technologies are increasingly competitive with coal, oil, and gas. The false choice between protecting the planet and uh, having good jobs in a sustainable economy is, is exposed for what has always been. And leaders from both developed and developing countries are calling for action. And I would, I would join others in saying that President Obama is clearly one of those leaders. He gets it at a very deep level. Uh, it's virtually certain that there's going to be a climate agreement here in, in Paris next week, but how effective that agreement will be is still all to play for. Uh, the good news, of course, is that as Minister Fabius and others have noted, we have uh, commitments on the table from uh, some 95% of, of uh, global emission countries. Over 180 countries have put forward their commitments, but of course the problem is, as we know, they don't add up enough to get us on track to stay below the 2 degrees Celsius target that President Obama and other leaders committed to coming out of Copenhagen, much less the 1.5 degree limit that the vulnerable countries and most NGOs call for. So we need a package of measures here in Paris next week to start to address this ambition gap. We need a long-term goal that sends a clear signal to business, investors, and citizens around the world that the age of fossil fuels, is, the end of the age of fossil fuels is inevitable, and the dawning of the age of renewable energy is unstoppable. We need encouragement of countries to develop long-term decarbonization plans over the next several years to provide a track to the future that they can ground their future actions in. We need a five-year cycle for review and revision of the intended um, uh, nationally determined contributions. Because as analyses have shown, if we lock in place the current level of ambition out to 2030, we will have used up three-quarters of the remaining carbon budget. It'll be very hard after that point to get back on track. The good news is I think we're continuing declines in renewable energy technology costs with growing public awareness and support for action. All countries should be able to put greater ambition on the table uh, by 2020, by the end of this decade. Of course, this ties back into the need for support, financial and technology support for developing countries to help them raise their game. A number of the developing countries have put forward two track INDCs, what they can do with their own resources, and what additional they could do to reduce emissions if they had support in terms of finance and technology. And I think one of the, the challenges for President Obama and his team here and leaders of other developed nations here like the European Union and Japan is what is their response going to be to these offers of additional ambition that are on the table from a number of major developing countries, which add up to a significant number of tons. How are we going to unlock that ambition over the next several years? President Obama, I think, deserves great credit for acknowledging in his speech today the role that the U.S. played in creating the climate problem, and as he said, embracing the responsibility to do something about it. He was quite direct on the dire impacts we face if we don't take greater action, and he was equally direct on the opportunities created 
by pursuing clean technology solutions that are available to us and that are increasingly cost effective. I think you hit the right notes of what we need out of Paris next week in terms of ever increasing cycles of ambition, a greater transparency on actions by all countries, and support for countries, developing countries, to skip over the dirty carbon intensive phase of their development path. But now his negotiating team needs to work hard over the next couple of weeks to secure those elements in the Paris Agreement. Paris must also address the need for a solidarity package to meet the needs of vulnerable communities that are already experiencing the impacts of climate change. Jackie talked about some of the impacts in the communities in the U.S. Uh, that uh, is, is double for uh, countries around the world, vulnerable countries around the world that don't even have the resources uh, that the United States provides to our communities. So we need to have a, a package that increases the share of public climate finance that's going to adaptation activities that lays out a clear pathway forward on the post-2020 finance scaling up of resources and addresses the issue of loss and damage, which are the costs of dealing with both sudden disasters like typhoons as well as slow ons onset impacts like sea level rise and drought. It was good to hear President Obama announce today that the U.S. will commit support for the Climate Risk Insurance Initiative uh, tomorrow and will recommit its support for the Least Developed Countries Fund uh, but the U.S. is going to need to show more flexibility on long-term finance, loss and damage, and other issues if we're going to get the ambitious and fair agreement we need out of Paris by the end of next week. And I would close by saying in this meeting tomorrow with the leaders of small island states, uh, President Obama needs to acknowledge directly to them that he understands the importance of addressing the loss and damage issue in the Paris Agreement and show that he hears what these leaders are proposing to help them deal with the ever more dire realities of climate change that they are facing. Thanks. Thank you, Alton. So we have to close a couple minutes early here just to warn folks because the, the Honduras government has this room immediately after us. So I'd love to actually just take a couple questions at, at the same time and then we can we can have a couple closing rounds right here in the front. And then right there in the back. What do you think took them so long? I mean, this has been so obvious all the way along, and they fought it and fought it, and now they're finally capitulating. But why did it take so long? Now it's almost too late. And could you also give, uh, could folks just give your name and affiliation? Uh, I'm Judy So from South African Television and Cape Town TV. Thank you. The fossil fuel sector, oil in particular, uh, they don't want to see a strong outcome here. And we finally are starting to tip the balance between their power and the power of the people. Um, and that's what shifted. Um, it's taken, a, it's taken too long, frankly, but we're, we can expect strong pushback from the oil industry if we start to see the kind of momentum we're describing here. Yeah, I just echo that and say my organization and others have documented a decades-long pattern of behavior by the fossil fuel industry in the United States to confuse public opinion, to mislead people about the science, and to block action on climate change. And the good news, of course, is that we are seeing increasing waves of actions may mention at the state level, the regional level, cities, businesses, etc. But I would say as to Congress, Congress is a lagging indicator. Congress is the last entity that's going to come around, partly because of our political system and how our campaigns are financed, in many cases by some of the same powerful interests they may refer to. But my, my gut tells me that within the next four or five years, even the Republican leadership in Congress is going to have to acknowledge reality and support meaningful action on this issue. I think this will be the last presidential election where the nominee of a major party may stand in the way of action. Uh, but unfortunately, it, had, it is late. It, we should have done this 15 or 20 years ago at least. Some of us have been working on it longer than that, and, and we're making these same calls for action back then. It's taken longer than it should have, but better late than never, and we need to get with it and start working and trying to catch up. Uh, well, acknowledging that because of the delay, we are going to experience increasing impacts no matter what we do on the, on the mitigation front over the next several decades, and we need to come to grips with that as well. Great, thanks, Alan. Is there one more question out there? Lydia, right here. Uh, yes, uh, one of you out there, Ms. Hamilton, referred to the nuclear power question and how that would fit into the so called uh, solution. Uh, I'm interested here from what the union certain scientists is to say about the use of nuclear power as a way to mitigate the problems of our climate change. Well, you can look on our website. We have a document called Nuclear Power in a Warming World. Um, you may or may not know that we're one of the foremost technical 
critics of the safety operation regulation of nuclear power in the United States, people often assume because we are an effective nuclear watchdog, we have to be anti-nuclear. We're actually agnostic. We say if the nuclear industry can address the safety concerns, can deal with the waste issue, can develop proliferation resistant technologies, and can operate and compete in the marketplace without huge government subsidies, then go for it. Uh, so far, they have not been able to demonstrate that ability, particularly the latter one. I think, as Avery Lovins has said, they've suffered an incurable attack of market forces. Uh, they are being priced out of the market, and even operating reactors that have been fully paid for in terms of their capital investment are shutting down because they can't compete in the market with natural gas and wind. This is an increasing problem for the U.S. nuclear industry. And while we should have been doing what we're doing now in the United States and a sub-national level at the United States 10 years ago, what has driven the changes is the economic opportunities that businesses are pointing to. That we have cut carbon significantly in some, especially the electricity sector in the United States. We did it not generally for carbon reasons, but to grow clean energy jobs and clean market opportunities. And that business case is driving forward momentum in the United States. It should drive forward momentum across the globe.